going to be a tough session. At least it'll be tough for me because I'm going to do a lot of talking and it's going to be worse for you because you've got to do a lot of listening. I tried honing these papers and I've made a little mess of it. So be patient with me. It will seem that I'm reading the whole book again. Believe me, I haven't touched upon this book. What I put together both last Tuesday and tonight are interesting aspects of Dawn over Mount Hera and Marzia Gale's beautiful writing talent so that you will be encouraged to read Dawn over Mount Hera yourself. So forgive me if I am talking too much. I'm going to not try to read everything so that it'll flow a little faster. We ended session one with a essay from section four. We're going to begin this se session with three essays from that session four before we go on to the last three sections. I've selected these three because they're simple. The white silk dress is about Tahare. The poet laureate is about Nabil. And Mirzi Abu Fazo in America is self-explanatory. In the silk white dress, there are three notable speakers on Tahare's qualities in this particular poem. Uh, the first is the French consul in Tabriz at the time of the martyrdom of the Bab. The first two gentlemen you will recognize from a lot of footnotes in the Dawnbreakers. Marzia Gale writes that Nicholas, the French consul in Tabriz, Nicholas tells us that Tahare had an ardent temperament, a just, clear intelligence, remarkable poise, and untamable courage. Then she moves on to the well-known Orientalist, Comte de Goubenou, and he says Tahare's chief characteristics of her speech was an almost shocking plainness. Now that surprised me because I always picture her as so erudite, but uh, Count de Goubenou says that her speaking was actually plain. Then he goes on and says, yet when she spoke, you were stirred to the bottom of your soul and filled with admirations and tears come to your eyes. And finally, the third one she mentions, speaking of Tahare, is Nabil known as the author of the Dawnbreakers. Nabil says, so Marzia writes, none could resist her charm. Few could escape the contagion of her belief. All testified to the extraordinary traits of her character, marveled at her amazing personality and were convinced of the sincerity of her conviction. In the second poem that I'm going to cover from section four, the poet laureate is about Naville. And it's very interesting because here is about Tahare, which mentions Nabil, and then here's Nabil who mentions Tahare. So Marzia Gale writes, Naville says that none could resist her charm. Oh, I read that, didn't I? <laughs> Nadaz got to edit again already. I told you I was going to have a hard time getting through this with all my messy notes. Okay. The young Nabil writes Marzia, 
learned that Tahare had been brought to Tehran and imprisoned in the mayor's house. Now he was in the same city with Baha'u'llah, with the master who was then a child of six, with Nawab, who was Baha'u'llah's wife, with the future most exalted leaf, who was Abdu Baha's sister, and with Tahare. Then two paragraphs later, Marzia writes again of Nabil. Another time they ask him, Nabil, to take Abdu Baha to school because the servant had not yet returned from the market. He describes Abdu Baha, six years old. The child with a capital C was very beautiful. He came out of his father's room dressed for the street in a lamb skin cap and an overcoat and walked down the steps. Navil reached down to carry him. Instead, Abdu Baha took his hand and said, we shall walk. They went out of the gate hand in hand, chatting together, the young man and the child. I wonder what the six-year-old Abdu Baha would be talking about. You always think of him as so serious because his responsibilities were so heavy. So now we have the essay, Mirzi Abu Fazl in America. She mentions her father in this one, Ali Kulikam. I'll try to say it without reading. At one time, Ali Kulikam was the amanuensis of Abdu Baha. And then Abdu Baha said he's going to send him on another mission. Ali Kulikani was so upset that he sobbed, and he, and Marzia says, and he did the Persian thing. He banged his head against the wall in the master's house in Akka. But Abdu Baha told him that he was going to be going to America to assist Mirzi Abu Fazl. And Marzia writes of her father, if I had never seen Abdu Baha and Shoghi Effendi, I would consider Mirza Abu Fazl the greatest thing I ever laid eyes on. When the master told me I must leave him, then he shows how upset he was. But Abdu Baha said it would be a real opportunity for uh, Ali Kuli Khan, Marzia's father, to serve Mirzi Abu Fazl in America. Now, I don't know if you have some of Mirzi Abu Fazl's books. I have two on my shelves. Miracles and Metaphors is one book. The other is Letters and Essays, 1886 to 1913. I can guarantee you that Nada will never ask me to give these Zoom sessions on these two books. They are just too above my head. I've had them for 60 years and I keep reading them and I could never repeat anything unless I really worked on it to anybody else. So his life is very interesting. However, I'd like to read the last two sentences of the essay, Mersey Abu Fazl in America. Yes, but merely to know his greatness, you had to watch him when he was in the presence of Abdu Baha. Then his knowledge reduced him to nothingness, and you thought of a pebble on the ocean shore. Truly, a brilliant scholar and a humble soul. So we're now moving to section five, which Marzia has called Age of All Truth. We begin with the essay, The Goal of a Liberated Mind. I found it interesting that she wrote this in 1929 when she had finished most of her university education. 
of the last school being Stanford University. She was later, uh, three years later in 1932, to get a degree on English from Berkeley. So the goal of a liberated mind, however, has nothing to do with her pursuit of scholarly knowledge. But I couldn't help thinking that it might, and it doesn't. It's a theme on the importance of truth and to search it out for yourself. In reality, she concludes that this truth is actually the word of God. I was amused by her beginning the essay by talking about Pontius Pilate. It seemed that this um, ruler was asking somebody what truth actually is. And then he didn't listen to the answer. Marcia suggests that the world is full of pilots asking questions and not bother listening for the answer. Um, another thing that made me smile about this particular essay is she gives the well-known quote, I think, therefore I am. She adds to it, it is equally true that if I do not think, I am not. I think she has a little spice in her writing. Marzia goes into the revela revelation on searching out justice, truth, and reality. In this case, she capitalizes reality. Baha'u'llah commands us to do our own thinking. So she first quotes Baha'u'llah, and then she gives us Abdu Baha's words, explaining the four ways of proving truth. Briefly, by sense perception, intellect, traditional authority, and inspiration. She says individually, they are inadequate. Collectively, they satisfy some truths. So we're supposed to individually seek truth. In this case, she says it's reality with a capital R. Question what reality is. And she quotes a lot of philosophers and then concludes maintaining, proclaiming that reality with a capital R is the word of God. Then she quotes John the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. We all know that. But she takes it into a more enlightened understanding. Of course, I notice in reviewing this particular session that a lot of what she had to say, although published in World Order books and in Star of the West, they really spoke to educating the new believer and particularly perhaps attracting seekers to what she's sharing of the revelation. So she says, the word is revealed to humanity by a divine manifestation, by one of those all illumined beings whom Abdu'l-Baha refers to as sons of reality. How often have we used sons of reality, studying it in our readings? And she relates it to this reality with a capital R. A Buddha, a Christ, Moses, Mohammed. Mohammed. Reality then constitutes the teachings of the divine manifestations. And reality in this day is the teachings of the Holy. Let's just look at the first sentence in the following three paragraphs. In other words, I've selected three of the following paragraphs, but I'm only going to give you the first sentence of each paragraph. This is Marzia's writing. Having found reality with the capital R, realities with a small r, are not far away. Having found reality 
realities are not far away. The true in art and science and every phase of human activity is that which is, is in accordance with the word of God and that which is like God. Therefore, a study of the word of God and a knowledge of God himself as revealed through his manifestations are infallible determinants of truth. Baha'u'llah is the spirit of truth who will lead us to all truths. The second one, the first paragraph, the first sentence of the second paragraph, I'm going to read it twice. The failure to seek for truth results in lasting and increasing peril to the human race. The failure to seek for truth results in lasting and increasing peril to the human race. The longer humanity doesn't wake up to the words of Baha'u'llah, the longer humanity will suffer. The sentence of the third paragraph, that no one is exempt from the search for out reality is proved by the further words of Abdu'l-Bahá. Each human being is equipped for the investigation of reality. Baha'u'llah says that God has endowed every soul with the capacity to hear the new call, to recognize his manifestation. The essay comprises a bit over three pages and it's compact with gems. Remember, it is titled, The Goal of a Liberated Mind, The Study of Reality. The next essay <clears throat> is called A Handful of Dust. I don't have much to say about it. I won't be covering it really, only to say that it's always timely in discussions on science and religion. She has different parts of her book, Gone Over My, Mount Hera, that actually lends itself to the subject of the agreement of science and religion, the origin of life. Marzia, we might say, I wrote, offers a challenge to Charles Darwin it's a shame that the two of them didn't live on the earth at the same time. Darwin died in 1882 and Marzia was born in 1908. I think she could have mentally taken him on, especially when, as she writes of this essay that he proclaimed. So in this essay, she's proclaiming Darwin. Darwin says, I am in an utterly hopeless muddle. I cannot think that the world is the result of change. And yet I cannot look at each separate thing as the result of design. He capitalizes result of divine, really saying he can't really know if there's a God or if he should believe in a God. Section five has two essays on women. Let's first put them in perspective of Marzia's life. I said she was born in 1908. So she was 12 years old when the United States Congress ratified the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. So the first of these two essays is The Rise of Women. Okay. She wrote it in 1947 when she was 39 years old and the World War II was open, over. You know, she does such cute things. The opening paragraph has Marzia writing about the first mention of women in the Britannic Encyclopedia. Under the title of Women, Diseases of, she then postulates that the tome seems to believe that being sick 
is the most pertinent fact about women. This is the Britannic Encyclopedia and their section on women. Men, she explains, fare far better. It is a man's world and the encyclopedia was written by a man. I'm injecting a story here that is true, that the Britannica Encyclopedia, when it started having a section on the Baha'i faith, uh, it was written by a Christian. And in that case, it erroneously did what so many articles do, uh, saying that the Baha'i faith is a sect of Islam. So representatives of the Baha'i faith went to the offices of Britannic Encyclopedia and said to them, when you have a section on Christianity, did you ask a Jew to write it? Well, the visit had its results in that the Baha'is were able to write the article for the Encyclopedia Britannica. I was amused by this. Forgive me, my male friends in the audience, but in the rise of women, <clears throat> Marzia not only writes that we live in a man's world, but adds that is the matter with it. A little tongue in cheek there. Okay. Now, we have to bear in mind that this essay about women was written a quarter of a century ago, and women have come a long way since then. And she postulates that a lot of women think that this is no thanks to men, that women had to overcome their opposition and are still a little farther away from their goal. So Marcia covers a lot of history in the essay on the rights or lack of rights for women, especially quoting the Holy Bible. This is very interesting from Marcia Gale. She looks at the Old Testament and the subject of polygamy. She reminds us, us of Christ's protection and encouragement of women, speaking to women as he did to men. Yet she writes, there is no justification for reading sex equality back into the New Testament. It is not there. Then she covers some secular history and says, anyone who believes that Christianity teaches sex equality has only to study the history of the women's suffrages movement. The dates alone tell the story. Now, she gives some dates. I'm gonna to try to be less wordy than my notes. She mentions 1792 and England and 1848 and New York. The 1792 is the publication of a book called A Vindication of the Rights of Women. The author is Mary Wolftencraft. Her mother was Mary Shelley. You know Mary Shelley from having written the famous book Frankenstein, which made a lot of money for Hollywood. But anyway, she writes in A Vindication of the Rights of Women that there were theorists and educationalists who thought that women should receive a rational education and not a political one or a secular one, but just a rational education, that they should have an education commensurate to their position as teachers of children. I'm paraphrasing this. So Britain officially gave women the right to vote in 1918. Then she talks about 1848 the first Women's Right Convention in Sene uh, Seneca Falls, New York. So what did I say about that? Well, not much, because that ended with America getting the right to vote in 1920 eventually. And she covers a lot of history in this particular subject on the rights of women. 
in between 1792 and 1848, she injects Tahare that this was the first suffrage for women's rights at the time. She doesn't skip Islam. She calls Muhammad the first modern feminist, quoting the rights of women in the Quran. There's so much in this dawn over Mount Hera that if you think I'm talking too much, well, you read the book, I'm not talking enough. Within the Baha'i faith, women have been given all kinds of rights. With the Baha'i administrative order of Baha'u'llah, the world order, uh, women have just as many rights as men in all the institutions of the faith. They are elected or appointed to serve the cause on high station, particularly in the United Nations. Baha'i women have been very popular in the United Nations as observers. Then, of course, that always leads to the question of, okay, women can do everything, but why aren't they on the Universal House of Justice? Which takes us back to Abdul Baha saying that uh, the reason will presently appear even as the sun in the midday sky. I always thought that that was enough nifty place for women to be at that height, at that right. So whatever the reason, it is not to the detriment of women. It's the word of God and we are obedient to it. Will it turn women off? Of course it will. But lots of things in the revelation of Baha'u'llah turn off the seekers. Okay, let's go on to Till Death Do Us Part, which actually is very heavy subject. It is written 10 years before the rise of women. The first was composed at the end of World War II, the second one, Till Death Do Us Part, mostly is about marriage. She says there's something that something is wrong with the holy state of marriage. One of her sentences suggests that the marriage is about to disappear altogether. Well, that's 1937. We're going on almost a century. One might think that Marzia Gale's prophecy has come true. Now, I have a book that I really like. Can you read that? When the World Center stopped publishing the high worlds like this and started publishing the high worlds like this, the immemorial was removed. And it was like a little obituary of the highs dying. The House of Justice wrote us and said that periodically they would be putting a book out like this of just the immemorials. I happened to pull out Marzia Gale's long immemorial in this book. And I found never to have children of her own. The publish, she published an article in the December 1937 issue of World Order Magazine entitled, Till Death Do Us Part, in which she briefly bemoans the childless marriage. She, there are, are also other things in this immemorial on Marcia Gale that have uh, repeat what we're covering from her Mount, uh, what is it, Dawn Over Mount Hera. Okay, that's all I have to say about Till Death to Us Part, because it really is a heavy subject and you will want to read it fully yourself. Atomic, atomic Mandate is our next essay, and it's of interest to me 
because you can imagine what atomic mandate is all about. It happened 14 years before she wrote this essay and the event took place in New Mexico where I now live. So the essay was of interest to me. It's of interest to Americans as presently in our theaters, they're showing the film Oppenheimer considered the father of the nuclear bomb. And it is of interest to the world's population as that event unleash man's ability to destroy much of mankind in a short period of time. That event in 1945 is the testing, the dropping of the first nuclear A-bomb. The thrust of Marzia's essay is the need to change the hearts of humanity to create a new kind of man. Section six, she calls the divine encounter. History, history, history. Marzia has a genius when it comes to history in the material and secular world. How much more in the world of religion, most especially Baha'i history. She certainly proves it in the second of six essays in section six. By the by, I was going to say some things about Marzia at the end of this session. And if you can get a hold of this article, you will be very moved by the life she led in service to the cause of God. I'm sure that it's on internet. Everything's on internet. So look for this particular book, The Baha'i World in Memorial 1992 to 1997. I haven't seen the second of these books come out in the World Center yet. So in section six, there is a essay called Echoes of the Historic Heroic Age. Echoes of the Heroic Age. Condensing this essay was a formidable task. It should really have its own session. I've even got a whole page on this particular subject. It should be mentioned that Marzia brings up personalities from the 17th century, mentioning Washington, Darwin, and Franklin among them. She ends the paragraph, the first paragraph, with the claim of an organization or a thing or a publication called Universal History. Has anybody ever heard of this universal history? Well, apparently it was from uh, 67 volumes of recorded history published in 1749 to 1768 in London. In that book is where the writers, scholars recorded that on September the 21st, 4004 BC was the beginning of creation. So this is where Abdu Baha was able to talk in America on this belief that the universe, the world was only about 6,000 years old. He says the theologians and religionists advance plausible proof that the creation of the universe dates back 6,000 years. And then adds, his, God's sovereignty is of old, not recent, not merely existent these five or 6,000 years. This infinite universe is from everlasting. 
Now, why is Marcia Gale mentioning those well-known men popular even in their own time? I see it as her usual surprisingly clever writing. She captures our attention and sets the stage of picturing the events of a period. Those men continue to be known and admired, but she segues. There's another man in the same period destined to outshine them, though few today are aware of his name. That man, says Marzia Gale, would be Sheikh Ahmad. I thought she'd segue into Baha'u'llah. No, she's talking about Sheikh Ahmad, one of the twin holy lights of the Baha'i faith, whom the West would come to call the saint. Famous for his knowledge of the Quran, at one period, he wrote 96 volumes of books. Mind you, Universal History had 67. Sheikh Ahmed had, what did I say? 96. And of course, he's famous in Baha'i history for being the founder of the Sheikh School, which was preparing students for the imminent arrival of the promised Ga'em. You realize our history, our Baha'i history, or even the history of the world would be different without this enlightened guidance. Marzia writes that Sheikh Ahmed's reputation even humbled the Shah. She writes how she knows all this history just boggles my mind. The Shah, the King of Kings, was anxious to meet and visit with Sheikh Ahmed. To do so, Marcia writes, the Shah would need to be escorted by an army of 10,000. Getting there, there wouldn't be enough support for 10,000 men. There wouldn't be enough food. The town would be too poor to feed them. So would Sheikh Ahmed come to see the Shah? The Shah, the Sheikh, the Sheikh said, yeah, I will. But after I make a pilgrimage, um, I wonder, would we tell the Queen of England, uh, we'll catch her on another visit? But he humbled the Shah by saying, yes, I'll come to visit, but after a pilgrimage. Sheikh Ahmed knew that the dawn was breaking and he would repeat two Muslim traditions. One of this being, and you gotta remember this, this is what he kept repeating. A woman shall give birth to one who shall be her Lord. Well, women are giving birth every day. Who's this woman who is going to give birth to one who will be her Lord? So after his pilgrimage, and while he's visiting with the shawl in November, 1817, Marzia writes, on the 12th day of the month, the wife of a favorite minister of the crown had a son. The saint's heart recognized this child. It was Baha'u'llah. Now, think about this. It was the Bab who was the promised Ga'im the one that the saint was preaching was soon to appear, the forerunner and co-founder of the new faith of God. Yet it was the latter, Baha'u'llah, that Sheikh Ahmed recognized. How are we normal, everyday human beings to understand the minds and hearts and souls of the Sheikh Ahmed's on such a spiritual level, it's beyond our reach. Sheikh Ahmed, Marzia says, was to become the successor. Back that up. A moment, Neda, of editing. Sayyid Qasim was to become the success. success. 
Shall I try a third time? Zayat Qasim was to become the successor of Sheikh Ahmad. Marzia tells us that at 11, he had memorized the entire Quran. At 12, he had a dream that he must become the disciple of Sheikh Ahmad. At 22, he became the saint's most trusted follower, she writes. Where his master had been cherished by royalty and cleric alike, the disciple was left to bear alone the massive battery of hate. Sayyid Qasim was preaching and Marzia Gale writes what he was preaching. The judgment day was allegorical that Muhammad did, make, did not make his night journey to heaven in his physical form that the physical bodies of men would not rise out of their graves at the resurrection. The cleric and the populace and the court were all stirred up with hatred for these claims of Sayyid Qasim. We don't have to repeat the results of that hatred. It's all over the dawnbreakers and the history of the faith. Sayyid Qasim Solis was visiting the home of Sayyid Ali Muhammad and having that youth visit the Sheikh school. We know the sweet stories of those two events. We also know that that youth was the promised Gayam, the Bab. Refraining from repeating history that we all know so thoroughly in the Dawnbreakers, I'll mention Marzi explaining that this period of the heroic age was part of a messianic period, a factor that is repeated in all the religions. However, she mentions the American Will, William Miller, who correctly prophesies that 1844 was the coming of the promised one, in this case, the return of Christ. Unfortunately, he and his followers awaited and watched for the physical fulfillment of the prophecies and not the metaphorical, always looking upward towards the clouds. A similar event not mentioned in our book is the German Templar colonies association with Baha'u'llah. Expecting the return of Christ, the Germans arrived in Haifa 30 October 1868, just weeks before Baha'u'llah, the return of the Spirit of Christ, left the ship that was taking him to the prison barracks in Akka, and he walked the shores of Haifa. Baha'u'llah made three other visits to Haifa, two of which he stayed in the German colony, yet none recognized him. Our essay, Echoes of the Heroic Age, goes on to chronicle that glorious day when Mullah Hussein was to meet and recognize Sayyid Ali Muhammad, the promised one, the expected Ka'em, the awaited Mahdi. Marzale, Marzale ends the essay saying that the event changed the world's life forever the fulfillment of all the religions of the world. And it will continue to change the life of the world. The destruction is not Baha'u'llah's doing. Everything that will be changed for the better is thanks to Sheikh Ahmad, Sayyid Qasem, the Bab, Baha'u'llah. And we could go on. In 1941, the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf was published. It was the last major tablet revealed by Baha'u'llah, and Marzia Gale wrote the introduction. I'll just say that I found this interesting, that she read the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf three times and studied it over a long period of time till she was qualified to compose the essay, which was the introduction to Epistle to the Son of the Wolf. 
our last essay, which is more than one page, friends, is her essay, Abdul Baha in America, which she wrote in 1944. There are many books on Abdul Baha in America, particularly the promulgation of universal peace which is a recording of 139 of Abdul Baha's talks in America. I used to erroneously say that it was all of his talks that he wrote that he gave in America, but I was wrong. I found out I was wrong when I got to know Ethel Revell. One of Abdul Baha's talks in Philadelphia was at a hotel. And when the talk was over and the guests probably left and the Baha'is never leave while they can look at Abdul Baha's beautiful face, he told them that in the morning he would be speaking at the Revell home. Of course, the Revells didn't know that that was going to happen. So that was not recorded in Promulgation to Universal Peace, but it is in Star of the West, so you can check it out. Whenever he spoke in Philadelphia the next day, he spoke at the Revell home. Mrs. Revell told her daughters, Ethel and Jesse, that when Abdul Baha came in, he was not to go into the kitchen because they had a broken faucet at the sink. So Abdul Baha came in, walked directly into the kitchen and got a glass of water out of that broken faucet. Ethel, when she tells this story, she would just smile. You can't tell Abdul Baha anything. No, he tells us things. Marcia gives us in this essay a sweet rendering of Abdul Baha when he wasn't giving a talk. She repeats that there were people like William Blake who wrote a poem that repeated a legend that His Holiness Jesus Christ made a visit to England. Now, mind you, His Holiness Christ had a ministry of only three years. Was there a Europe that he could get to in a boat and get back to the Holy Land to continue his three years, I doubt that. So how that legend got started, a rumor, I don't know. But what's interesting about it is that I heard at the World Center that Abdu Baha had said, if you wanna know what Jesus looked like, look at Abdu Baha. So the image of His Holiness Christ, Abdul Baha, the mystery, did go to England. So it's like a reflection of Christ in the physical body of Abdul Baha. So the legend may have gotten mixed up in the telling. Okay. She talks about Abdu Baha passing the Statue of Liberty. It's hard to believe that it was only dedicated 26 years before Abdu Baha came to America. You know, we think of the Statue of Liberty as kind of turning on antiquity, and yet it was only 26 years old when Abdu Baha crossed it in New York. He spoke on this statue, calling it a symbol of freedom. But he praised the true freedom of being released from the prison of self. A reporter had been following Abdul Baha, Marzia writes, around the ship with Cedric and asked him about women's suffrage. His answer included that the world of tomorrow will be much more a woman's world than now because the spiritual qualities are gaining ascendancy. Here's something I took and researched, like Marzia Gale's example. I wanted to look at the background of the history. The essay states that Abdu Baha's 
first public talk was in the Church of the Ascension in New York City. Now, Marzia is not saying this is true. She's repeating that the Abdu Baha's first public talk was the Church of the Ascension in New York. It wasn't his first talk. There were four others in private facilities before the church one. Now, what I found out in researching this Church of the Ascension in New York City, it still exists. It's a beautiful church. So, but there's a history that you can find out about this Ascension Church in New York City. The history in World Wide Web says this. One of the first ecumenical events held at Ascension, the son of the follower of the Baha'i faith, Abdu Baha, speaks at Ascension. That's true. This marks the first official instance of the Baha'i faith being expressed in the United States. We all know that's not true because what was the first mention of the faith was in 7, 1893 at the religion parliament of the 1903 Chicago, 1893 parliament of religious religions during the Chicago's World Fair. So, 1893 was the first formal mention of anything to do with the Baha'i faith, and that was the passing of Baha'u'llah. So that it's nice that the Church of Ascension is mentioning the history of their church with Abdu Baha, but their facts are a little wrong. It was after that 1893 Parliament of Religions during the Chicago Fair that people started coming into the Baha'i faith. Marzia writes that in 1898, 141 New York, in New York became Baha'is during the first five months that the Eastern Baha'is came to help the teaching work sent by Abdu Baha. The next year, 1899, I found interesting to keep in my little noggin. The first Black woman American became a believer, Miss Olive Jackson of, of course, New York City. I'm skipping some things on this paper. There were important people who wanted to meet Abdu Baha and did meet Abdu Baha. Miss Maple Broadman, was the secretary of the Red Cross. It was known, Marzia says, that she never left her office except to consult with President Tapp, yet she did to meet Abdu Baha. Admiral Perry was just back from the North Pole and the celebrity of the hour. Alexander Graham Bell was the inventor of the telephone. He, of course, had Abdu Baha to his home for what was known as their Wednesday night symposiums, at which Graham Bell, Alexander Graham Bell, would invite as many of the smartest scientists that he could get a hold of, and they would talk about science. The master's talk included saying that the telephone was vitally important, but that his own work was to teach men how to communicate with God. So he's got another case where he's linking science and religion, that you can't separate the two. You know, Baha'u'llah says that science is everlasting and religion is eternal, or vice versa. I have a long thing about someone else that, um, Abdu Baha talked to. His name is Hudson Maxim. He's the inventor 
of a high explosive called maximite. I guess it precedes dynamite. I'm not going to read it, but this maxim tried to convince Abdul Baha of the safety of working with maximite, that it was safer than working in an industrial factory. And Abdul Baha was saying, you know, why are we creating more powerful and more powerful weapons? Marcia Gale writes that Abdul Baha humorously said, you know, we've been trying this fighting all the time and it's getting us nowhere. How about if we try for peace? If it doesn't work, we'll just go back to fighting. So she shares that little humor of Abdul Baha. And of course, now we have bombs that can kill hundreds of thousands and devastate a whole city in minutes. That's the end of my notes, folks. There is so much in this book. I, there are essays I didn't mention. The essays that I did mention, you just got a little sprinkle of a pouring of water of knowledge, beautifully written by a beautiful woman, Marcia Gale. I'm sure she's right up there with all of these people that she mentions and she's teaching them some more. That wasn't too bad. No, it was great. Thank you so much. Does anyone, this is the, the second session of the last session. There were only two sessions. So if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself. Please, Leighton. This is just an observation. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned as an aside at the beginning, about the ministry of the House of Justice. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to relate that to um, the Queen. You also mentioned the Queen of England, who died on the 8th of September last year. The House of Justice came into being in 1963, 60 years ago. And look what has been accomplished in those 60 years. The queen reigned, I'm gonna use reign as her ministry for 70 years. When her father died in 1952, there were less than 10 countries in the British empire. When she died and she transformed the empire into the Commonwealth. When she died, there were 53 countries in the Commonwealth. And this is it. Imagine, number one, if Christ's ministry lasted for 70 years rather than three. Imagine if Muhammad's ministry lasted for 70 years rather than 21. Imagine if the Bob's ministry lasted for 70 years instead of six years. Imagine if Baha'u'llah's ministry lasted for 70 years. Imagine Abu Baha's ministry lasting for 70 years. And imagine if we had the Guardian's ministry for 70 years. Where would it be today? It's a good, suppose, what would it be like? Thank you, Leighton. You got all those years right, too. And she outlasted the queen who did get a message from Baha'u'llah, Victoria. Thank you, that's very interesting. Any other comments? Did we draw any other thoughts from the audience? Uh, Kathleen. Kathleen. I just wanted to mention that I had a little trouble finding the book, but I actually found it on eBay in one of the uh, stores that was listed. But I'm really looking forward to reading it now. I am so glad I, I chimed in today and, and heard you talk. So thank you so very much. Oh, you'll enjoy it. You'll read it for years and years. 
Uh, let's see. Don't go away. Speaking of the Queen, Clayton, I have this on my email if anybody wants it. My friend sent it to me. Let's see if you can read it. Yes, I see. Yes. Um, another question. Um, I had some problems last week with my computer, and you were mentioning about on the back of a photograph of May Maxwell, there was something written on that. What was written on the back of that photograph? Yes. Uh, the road, the road, the road, the road. Let's see if I left the page here. I made so many copies of that. Can I get up? Can I get up? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> We will edit this time for you to look for it, so don't worry. Got it. I got it. The path to God, <clears throat> excuse me. This is May Maxwell. The path to God is so narrow that there is only room for one. It is so rough and hard that feet are torn. At times it is so dark that the way is hidden. And at all times, that which is before us is a cross. This was on the back of a photograph of the master's house, an eight by 10. And Rahia Kanu was cleaning off a desk in the master's house. And Violette, Nell and I were helping her and she was getting ready for another teaching trip. And I picked up that photograph and looked at the back and found this handwriting. And I showed it to Rahia Kanum and she said, that's my mother's handwriting. And I asked if I could make a copy of it. We had one copying machine at the World Center at the time. And everybody wanted a copy, Violet, now myself. So I made copies of this and I've been sharing it ever since. It's just a beautiful quote because May Maxwell suffered for the faith with bad health. Thank you very much. Illuminating as ever you have been. <laughs> okay, friends, anything else? Well, you all are going to be missed by me. Thank you so much for being in my little circle of audience and stay healthy. In front of me, a uh, part of a letter, a part of a message from the National Assembly for the feast of Kalamat in July. I was so impressed with it, I put it up on my cock. The willingness to set aside secondary matters and to devote ourselves individually and collectively to the advancement of the cause of God. I like that phrase, set aside secondary matters in service to the cause. <laughs>